But first of all, thank you to, to everybody for um, for coming along this evening. And uh, the biggest thanks go to to Mike and Pitt for contributing their time. For what I know is a, a really tricky period of the year with uh, children of school um, juggling various different things all at once. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hugely grateful to both of you for that. And also very grateful on a, on a personal level and professional level for your work and development around the sort of guidance document and the movement and the, the progress we've made within physiotherapy around point of care ultrasound. So just to just to put that on record um, right at the start, if I can come to, to you guys to introduce yourselves, um, Pip, if I just pin you, um, there we go. I didn't feel a thing. It's still here. <laughs> Top, not top quality Zoom banter. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well, welcome, uh, Stu. Thanks very much for um, um, inviting me along to this and, as, uh, and reminding me or else I would have been um, out eating and drinking somewhere when I, I should have been here. And uh, this uh, it's, uh, great to be with you all. So I'm Pip White. I'm professional advisor at the Chartered Society of uh, Physiotherapy. I am a practicing physiotherapist. Uh, as well and within my remit at the CSP I sit within the practice team so I um, look after a lot of practice governance and regulation uh, as well as I look after the uh, indemnity insurance scheme for CSP members who are based in the UK and practicing in the UK and then uh, worldwide so my sort of uh, short focus on this will be sort of from the CSP perspective of this. Super. Welcome and thanks again, Pip. Mike, I'll bring you in. Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Mike Smith. I'm a, a senior lecturer at Cardiff University in the UK. Uh, so I'm also a, a physio by original training. And when I was doing my PhD, I uh, did my PGC um, in medical ultrasound through uh, the medical school in Cardiff University. Um, so worked with many colleagues over a number of years and uh, specifically around point of care ultrasounds, um, as well as working with other um, kind of career imaging, sonography, radiology uh, organizations like Bemis. And the kind of main thrust of my work really is around supporting uh, the expansion and consolidation of point of care ultrasounds. So I'm fortunate to work uh, with physios um, in, in a range of different specialisms, including some work we did around the pandemic uh, and use of lung ultrasounds in COVID, um, and now also with other specialities for so speech language therapy, um, acute medicine, emergency medicine, uh, and increasingly in some low and middle income countries. So, uh, but MSK is where it all started. So it's a, it's a real kind of privilege to support um, uh, this very valuable work. So, Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. Super. So um, the plan tonight, guys, really is to do, to hand over, me just to hand over actually the presentation part of it. Um, so I chiefly to Pip, to Pip and to Mike. Um, so what we're going to do is Pip's just going to give us a five, 10 minutes um, overview from her perspective. Uh, we're then going to hand over to Mike to do the same for five to 10 minutes. And then the idea is that we then have uh, essentially an open discussion with the three of us as a, as a, as a panel, if you like. Um, so what I'd encourage you to do during the evening is um, to put your questions into the chat. And then when we come to a close, um, what I'll start to do um, is I will um, go to the sort of the chat for, for the questions and pull them together uh, and bring them in. Um, what I'm going to do is just spotlight you, um, Pip, as well. So I think everyone can see you there, which works really well. There we go. Um, perfect. Um, and then, yeah, just guys, during the, during the, the presentation, if we could all just make sure that we're on mute, uh, I'll do the same now. Um, but over to you, Pip. Right now, um, whew, bit of a bit of a sweaty hand moment of do I press the right button? So um, hopefully everybody can um, see the screen. Stu, has that come up all right? Have you got my title slide? Yeah, it looks, looks right. absolutely perfect. Yeah, oh, great. great. Right. So really, uh, why why now? Um, I've um, popped up on the screen here. These are snips from our website. Uh, the link is up on the top right of the screen and those will be accessible to anybody who is a member of uh, the CSP. Um, so what, why now, really? 
why have we decided or why have we needed to give um, advice to members about the context and the practice guidance uh, for point of care ultrasound? Well, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy is the arbiter for the scope of practice of the profession uh, as a whole in the UK. And our governing council or the professional committee really determines what is in or out of scope of practice um, where there, you know, where, where there is um, a movement in practice that has a potential for significant impact to the profession. So, for example, back in 1997, uh, council made a very clear direction that injection therapy was within the scope of physiotherapy practice. And really, that was where it started bringing it from the realms of extended practice into um, regular advanced practice. Uh, and last year, um, we've made the very clear decision that the use of complementary alternative and holistic therapies for the avoidance of doubt are not physiotherapy at all. So point of care ultrasound very clearly is within the scope of physiotherapy uh, practice uh, as a whole in the UK. But given its growth, uh, the growth of its use across a number of professions, uh, and I know Mike will talk about that, um, the CSP on the advice of key members and the advice of our governing committees has taken steps to assure that POCUS, where it is un undertaken by physiotherapists in the UK, meets defined levels of education and practice because ultimately in the UK, the title physiotherapist is a regulated and protected title and the regulator's role in the UK is to protect patients. And so we wanted to do something else to help our members working in this environment, to give them a framework of what safe and effective, well-governed practice looks like. So this guidance uh, sits uh, alongside a range of other professional publications that we have. We have um, similar guidance for uh, injection therapy, uh, and we also have guidance for prescribing, which um, whilst it is more regulated in the UK than POCUS, uh, is a similar level, uh, it needs that similar level of depth of guidance to really assure patients that if they see a physiotherapist in the UK who who's using POCUS, that patient can be assured that their physio is regulated by the HCPC and is also um, working within uh, context and guidance that we are um, providing at the CSP. So, your, so one of the documents we made was, was practice guidance, but before you can really describe the boundaries and expectations of something, you have to define it. And I apologize that this is a very wordy slide. Uh, it is within the practice guidance. Uh, it's a definition that was arrived at after you know, working with, with Mike and colleagues. But it's really helpful that gives that real foundation stone of what is it that sets the physiotherapist using this modality apart from anybody else. And at the CSP, we take the view of setting out what it is that physiotherapists offer. We don't take an approach of um, comparing ourselves to other professions, because, of course, we speak from the position of we represent physiotherapy. What do we do? So the only other activity where we really define what it means for UK practice is prescribing, which is statutorily regulated. Point of care ultrasound isn't regulated, but because physiotherapists are, we believe that this definition will help physiotherapists distinguish themselves and their role, because it really adds that in the UK, uh, physiotherapists can offer you that one stop shop of assessment, diagnosis and intervention and rehabilitation. So this is the definition. And everything uh, really flows from this and Mike will pick this up later. I just want to add one point here that um, people practicing in the UK may ask. Um, people always worry 
what happens if I'm sued? Who will I be judged against? Will I be judged against uh, a sonographer, a radiologist or what? So in the UK, the legal standard of care that you will be judged against remains the Bolan Belitho standard, two very famous legal cases way back when. And that says that you will be judged against a peer with the same um, skill and competence in the same context. So what that means in practice is that you will be judged against a fellow physiotherapist practicing point of care ultrasound, which again is another reason why practice guidance and context is important because it sets out in writing what reasonable looks like. So um, other professions may have different views, but just remember when you're doing this, you will be judged as a physiotherapist against your peers. And many of those peers will be in this room this evening. So this is why this kind of event is very helpful because this is where the body of knowledge is created and generated. And the final point for me, again, for members based in the UK, we're often asked at the CSP, how am I insured? What's my insurance look like? So for members, if you're in any doubt about your specific circumstances, please contact the CSP's insurance brokers. They'll be able to help you. So to clarify, point of care ultrasound is within the scope of the physio profession as a whole. So what does that mean for you? If you are using POCUS and you are employed, and that means that you have an employment contract with somebody, whether that's the NHS or a private provider or anybody else, you don't have to worry about your indemnity because you'll be covered by the vicarious liability that your employer is obliged to have. But what you should do is check your job description to make sure that your job description accurately reflects what you are being asked to do. And so that should include point of care ultrasound as part of your physiotherapy practice. The gold star goes for the self-employed because that's where we as the CSP, we provide as part of a membership benefit, um, a comprehensive uh, professional indemnity scheme. Now, as with any insurance product, that will come with terms and conditions and exclusions. So what you have to ask yourself is, am I working as an individual? Uh, in which case you will be covered subject to the terms and conditions of the policy. Uh, the main ones are that you need to be HCPC registered and maintain your membership of the CSP. Um, other terms do apply. Or if you work as a company so that you've set yourself up as a limited company or a limited liability partnership, um, you will, again, you first of all need to consider your turnover cap because the CSP PLI isn't really designed as a business cover, but we do cover some entities where they turn over less than £140,000 a year. And again, there are very specific terms and conditions. So if in doubt, do call our, our brokers. I know some of you will, might have quite um, complicated uh, business arrangements. The brokers are there to help, but for general, we don't see any problem with this and it would be covered subject to terms and conditions of the scheme. So happy to um, take any questions later on towards the end, but that's all for me. So I'll hand you back to Stuart. Thanks. Super, thanks Pip, that's great. Uh, let me now try and put uh, mic on there. Um, there you go, Mike. Do you want to just share your screen? Perfect. Yeah. Can you see that okay? Wonderful. Yeah. Fabulous. All over to you. Great. So, uh, Pip, thank you for, for summarising that. Um, so, uh, I'm going to step take a little step back um, and provide a slightly more of kind of a, a helicopter view I guess really of, of the the landscape um, so in terms of uh, as I kind of covered in, in the initial uh, introductions my work is very broad so I work with a range of different physiotherapy specialisms um, also with many colleagues um, who are in sonography radiology um, and then also a lot of other um, clinical specialities and indeed other healthcare systems who uh, who use point of care ultrasound. Um, so I thought it'd just be helpful to provide that kind of broader context really. Um, so 
very quick uh, run through of a, a few different areas, which you can see on the screen there. So in terms of the first one, um, in terms of background to sonography and point of care ultrasounds, um, and this is a, a very broad brush strokes here. So uh, depending on the healthcare setting you, uh, you work in, um, then there might be some, some differences. But if we're thinking about ultrasound imaging, um, then uh, historically that's been based within radiology services um, where there is that availability of uh, plain films, MRI, CT, a range of other imaging uh, within which ultrasound imaging would have sat. Um, and the a large proportion of the imaging would have been undertaken by our colleague sonographers. So, uh, by, by sonographers, uh, again, there'll be different terminology that um, the colleagues will use, but we're thinking here of those for whom their profession um, is the, uh, the undertaking of ultrasound imaging um, and depending on the healthcare system, the, uh, the reporting on that imaging as well. So in terms of the training routes, then that historically would have been many of those colleagues would have come with a radiography training um, who postgraduates would have undertaken extensive uh, sonography training. Um, and indeed, in that regard, it's it's very much, you know, a specialism um, uh, with a very lengthy training period um, uh, uh, across a range of very complex specialisms. Um, but as we know, many other professions have also um, kind of taken up some of those roles. So, you know, example might be uh, midwifery sonographers, um, and and now that's becoming increasingly diverse um, in terms of different um, uh, individuals working within sonography. But obviously today is really about point of care ultrasounds. And here we're thinking of clinicians um, who are their primary role is, is within treatment, uh, triage, assessment, um, where they're using ultrasound imaging as an adjunct uh, to the, the management of, the, of those patients. And as we mentioned before, uh, many different uh, professions, pretty much all specialisms really within healthcare provision, uh, both human and non-human, uh, use point of care ultrasounds, uh, and also physiotherapists are one of those groups who, who are heavily involved within it. So um, if we're thinking then in terms of the, the use of, uh, of ultrasound within physiotherapy, then clearly that's um, been uh, present for a long time um, and it's great to see uh, many uh, distinguished colleagues on the call today who um, certainly predate me in terms of uh, really driving the, the specialism forwards. Uh, within MSK then certainly uh, that's been um, arguably one of the largest areas of growth um, and, and indeed kind of a volume of um, physiotherapists undertaking point of care ultrasounds um, and many of those have then diversified in terms of going on to work within radiology services and I or a good question pop up earlier on, which we can we can address in terms of that distinction between point of care ultrasound um, and sonography radiology services. But in terms of the uh, the use of ultrasound by physiotherapists and really the the CSP document, it is the first that we're aware of in the world to provide um, guidance that spans a range of different specialisms, because many of our other clinical colleagues um, do extensively use point of care ultrasounds, whether that be rheumatology, uh, pelvic health. Obviously, they they have a degree of overlap those two specialisms with, with MSK, but also our lung critical care colleagues, our neurology colleagues, uh, as well. And then we're also thinking about some of the areas of additional complexity. So uh, many of those on the on the, the call today uh, might be using it from a private practice perspective, which brings perhaps its own challenges, its own questions, uh, particularly in terms of, of um, uh, second opinions um, uh, as well, and also sports as well, which brings again complexities. And then overlapping with that, we've also got injections prescribing and whether those are blind, image guided, uh, whether somebody is just doing an injection list, an image guided injection list. So again, the layers of the onion certainly increase in terms of the complexity. Um, and so uh, again, the, the value of trying to provide some clarity in this area. So one of the aspects there um, is the, um, the membership of the CSP uh, with CASE. And certainly one of the things that I'm very passionate about is that um, uh, ultrasound imaging is multi-professional in its nature. Um, so um, our sonography colleagues are, are the experts in ultrasound imaging may well be drawn from a range of different parent professions. Um, uh, point of care ultrasound users certainly come from a, a wide range of different specialisms as well. So being aware of the complexities of sonographic landscape um, and indeed contributing to them, informing them, uh, I, I believe is very valuable. So uh, a 
quite a few years ago now, I, I, I would like to claim I had more hair at the time, but I didn't. Um, I initiated the process of the CSP joining CASE, the Consortium for the Accreditation of Sonographic Education. And indeed, I'm sure many of you on the call um, maybe will have under, undertaken your training through a CASE accredited course. Um, so in that regard, the CSP was the first uh, uh, kind of treating um, assessment uh, profession, as it were, to, uh, with an emphasis on that, sorry, to, to join um, CASE and, and indeed the Royal College of Podiatry joined soon after. So that really is about us being um, very much uh, on that top table with our sonography colleagues in terms of being able to support with the scrutinizing of, of education provision and indeed um, uh, sharing perspectives on the future of, of training in that area. So in terms then um, of opportunities and challenges for physios using um, uh, uh, point of care ultrasound. So um, uh, probably I'm, I'm preaching to the converted. If you've given up a, uh, an evening to join us on the call today, you perhaps know for yourself the, the transformative benefits that can be derived from using point of care ultrasound. I, I really view it as, as a, an opportunity for kind of next generation physiotherapy. And um, for those of you in the UK, then um, uh, you might have seen an article uh, in uh, the, this current month's edition, uh, myself and Sue Hayward Giles from the CSP, uh, talking about prompting elements around that next generation provision of care. Whether that's new care pathways, new configurations, new staffing, opportunities to work at that cross-profession interface, uh, a hugely exciting um, area. So very, very exciting. But also something that comes with challenges, um, and, and those are uh, uh, many in, in their nature. So one of the aspects I, I use within my work is the, the point of care ultrasound triangle and, and a framework approach to try and address these different challenges. Um, in terms of the scope of practice, then um, Pip uh, described very eloquently um, the, the legal and the insurance situation within the UK for physiotherapists. Um, but again, there are complexities within that. And so a lot of the work is done with individuals, specialisms, professions, in terms of defining and outlining what is and, and what is not within scope uh, for those different groups how that aligns and can be addressed with relevant education competency considerations and then governance elements as well, professional permissions, and clearly that dovetails with the CSP, HCPC uh, for physiotherapists within the UK, insurance indemnity, which again, um, Pip very eloquently described there as well. So in terms of the, the framework approach, um, uh, we've uh, um, very privileged to work with a, a range of different colleagues from a range of different specialisms. Um, from a, a, a physiotherapy perspective, we've had a, a number of publications recently, one around uh, lung ultrasounds by respiratory physiotherapists, uh, and also for our pelvic health colleagues. Um, those are both open access um, articles, and indeed they're linked within the CSP uh, tab, so um, uh, very um, welcome to access those. And we're in the final stages of um, two further papers, one on uh, um, uh, ultrasound image guided botulinum toxin uh, for the management of spasticity from a neurology perspective uh, and also one on point of care ultrasound and also ultrasound image guided interventions the couple of thorny topics um, uh, which we hope to to have in the public domain relatively soon so um I guess that's, uh, that's the kind of end of the, of the talk through from me. Um, certainly from my perspective, it's a real privilege for me to work with a lot of different professions and specialisms. Um, I know we've got um, colleagues from a range of different backgrounds and, and regions on the call today. So uh, it'd be great to take your, your questions and, um, and hopefully, hopefully provide some clarity. Brilliant. Thanks to both of you. They're both uh, fantastic as anticipated. <laughs> Um, thanks so much uh, for your input. Um, what we're going to do now, I think, is um, I'm trying to sort of go back. I think I've done it, actually. I've managed to um, pin us all back on the screen, hopefully. Uh, there's Pip. Great. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is go through um, just some of the questions, really, that come up on the chat. I'm sure this will, the discussions that we'll probably have will lead to more questions coming up. So... I will do my best to try and keep up with them on, on the chat and, and multitask, which is um, always something I've, challenged, I've found challenges. Anyway, let's see how we get on. So, um, Mike, you, you, you mentioned the first one. Um, and I'm happy for you guys to sort of, you know, sort of take these if you want to, or whatever. But the first question from Matt Daly was, where does Pocus end and Sonographer start? <laughs> great question. Matt, that is a great question. Um, uh, 
Crikey. Uh, yes. So I, I guess um, from my perspective, it depends on why you're asking the question. Um, and and I'm, uh, Pip, I'm sure, will be able to provide a, 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 a different perspective on this for, from kind of a, a what is and what is not deemed within physiotherapy and, and, and kind of covered from a PLI perspective. So um, uh, one of the challenges, I guess, really is that the, with certainly within the UK, that sonography, sonographer, um, uh, shockingly, are not protected titles. Um, certainly, colleagues, um, uh, for example, Bemis, um, Score, um, many distinguished colleagues um, have worked for a very long time, uh, and I've supported with some of those initiatives um, to push for regulation. But for a whole variety of different reasons, including Brexit and pandemics, uh, that has not come to pass. And um, um, certainly recent communications from Bemis indicates um, that that is certainly not on the horizon. So um, you have a very well-defined professional group, physiotherapists in the UK, and you have sonography um, not really being well-defined within the UK. Um, in terms of uh, with the context of what we're talking about today, then the, the main way I would say would be, um, are you using it as an adjunct to your parent profession practice as a physiotherapist? Um, so a, a rubbish example I often give um, is if you are using ultrasound imaging to uh, guide the injection of uh, botulinum toxin, neurotoxin uh, for spasticity, then you, that is within your scope of practice as a physiotherapist. And if you're injecting it into um, the face for wrinkles, then you are clearly not using it as a physiotherapist. And therefore, you know, it is not POCUS in that regard. Um, a different way to view it, I guess, would be that um, as a sonographer, then um, uh, the likelihood is you are receiving a referral um, and you are undertaking a scan on the request of a, um, a referring clinician. Uh, you are likely to be undertaking a, a fairly broad scan, um, a, a protocol based one, and reporting your broad findings, plus and minus conclusions, back to that referring clinician for them to act upon. Whilst within point of care ultrasounds, uh, it's as Pip described, it's 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 all bundled together. So, um, Pip, do, what uh, did you want to add or clarify, Samara? Oh, no, you've taken the words out of my mouth. I think it's absolutely right. Um, when you are using POCUS as a physiotherapist, you are using it to to assist another part of your practice, whether that is assessment, diagnosis, or intervention. Um, it's it's not a standalone task and that's the whole thing that you need to understand you should be doing other things as well for it to be part of physiotherapy practice matt did you want to jump in there yeah just a, a, a follow-up question i guess um so if an so if i'm using pocus in my shoulder clinic um i get that if radiology say we've got an MSK list, so it remains as MSK, and we'd like you to do that list, um, and in that moment behave as a sonographer, so potentially yes, report, but as a clinician, a bit like a radiologist, an MSK radiologist would offer a clinical opinion. Can you can you do that? Can you shift one day uh, to help the radiology services? Um, and if so, how does that work? <laughs> sure, yeah. So if I started off and then um, Stu, I know you uh, do some of this, so you, I'm sure you can share your insights as well. So um, uh, my understanding of the, uh, the, from a CSP perspective, would be that um, on the first day when you're doing your shoulder clinic as a physiotherapist, presumably, uh, and you're set, you know, you're receiving those referrals, you're assessing that patient as a physiotherapist, um, and you're choosing to use point of care ultrasound as an adjunct to your management of that patient, you're acting as a physiotherapist, you're using point of care ultrasound, um, and depending on, on the flow charts, then, uh, you know, CSP PLI would apply. Um, on the second day, um, when you are receiving a list um, and you are de facto undertaking imaging on somebody else's request and reporting it back, um, then you are not acting as a physiotherapist. Um, you are not using point of care ultrasound. Um, and depending on the scenario, CSP PLI would not apply. Yeah, I think if I could pick it, it's a really important thing. If you're employed, 
CSP PLI doesn't, apply anyway. doesn't doesn't apply yeah. anyway. <laughs> so if you're you know if you're employed, it's the trust. I think the big issue from a CSP perspective is workforce. Um, you have to really think about what we don't like at the CSP is where the physiotherapy workforce is plundered to address shortages in other professions. Um, individuals often like to do that because you know it um, offers um, reward, value, respect, status. It's it's in if it's indicative of a wider workforce problem, you really have to be careful of being drawn away, because if you're doing a radiology list, you're not doing that physiotherapy list. And there is clearly a need for highly skilled physios. And if you, they can take you away from it, it could be a slippery slope to um, losing a post. So just be very, very, very careful um, if you're drawn into that. Yeah, it's, re it's a really, really interesting area, this. And I, I, obviously, I'm essentially somebody who has a leg either side of the fence. Um, <laughs> um, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's desperately uncomfortable, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great, it's a really good question, Matt. And um, I guess so just to clarify, Pip, that's one that would basically you would need to flag with your local NHS trust to establish where you sit with regards to that. And um, I certainly, I certainly would echo um, what Pip has just mentioned there. Just from my own professional, I guess, career perspective, is that I think there are a lot of skills. If you are using ultrasound and MSK perspective at the point of care, um, I think there are a lot of um, benefits educationally to work in a radiology um, domain. But I certainly encourage people that um you know you, your 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 core roots are, are within physiotherapy and that's where your real uniqueness comes and your skills are um and um, I, I hopefully i'm not speaking out of turn when i say that. I, feel, I feel like i bring a lot to the radiology environment and i also bring you know some of that radiology learning back to the point of care environment as well so there is a complementary element to it um as well um, but it's a, it's a it's a really good question because it's increasingly something that is um happening out there um that people are having opportunities and i guess it comes off the back of probably mentoring opportunities as well and developing connections and networks within trusts and that's a very positive thing as well i would say is those is, is, is fostering harboring those relationships between msk services and radiology services is incredibly powerful and very very beneficial um but um yeah we have to be conscious of of of, of the workforce and, and also not losing our skills for clinicians into too much into radiology domains completely agree brilliant uh next question there's a few more questions sort of firing in now which is fantastic so thank you guys for your engagement um uh, we work in a mixed ot physio msk team are there different requirements for ot's shall i have a go at that one uh, go for it mike yeah, um, so it, it's a really great question, Lisa. So um, uh, Stu, myself and many other colleagues um, uh, work in, in a variety of capacities with um, podiatrists um, and um, are relatively aware of the, the kind of conditions um, uh, for, for our podiatry colleagues. Um, I actually don't know with regards to OT. I have no idea. Mm. I suppose... Um... My thoughts would be, obviously, we, you know, we've created these to help physiotherapists. Uh, if OTs are moving into this area, question would be get in touch with your professional body um, and ask if uh, they'd like to adopt or adapt ours, which is how prescribing practice guidance started. It started with physios and pods and has been taken across all the professions the thing here is to is consistency and to think about this is about protecting patients what do you need in place to be safe and effective for patients and these our guidelines were written for physiotherapists and I don't know if they would be appropriate for the context and practice of occupational therapy um, but yeah get on get on to the Royal College of OT uh, next, hopefully I'll answer your question, Lisa. Uh, the, 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 I will also just say the, cha the challenge with ultrasound is that the landscape is quite complex and quite difficult. So um, if we don't answer your uh, question with uh, absolute conviction and certainty, that is why. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we are doing our best. Yeah. Um, the only thing I would say there, uh, Lisa, is um, if 
if your OT colleagues aren't sure, um, feel free to, to get them to drop me an email and we can certainly have a, yeah. you know, a, a chat with, um, uh, with the OT. Yeah, no problem. Fantastic. Spencer's question, as a sonographer, brackets radiographer, where would I stand guiding physiotherapists to perform injections? Who takes the responsibility? Private clinic, not NHS. Mm. This is probably one for you. Probably. Yeah, I think uh, I'm looking at that. Spencer, if you can pop in the chat, what do you actually mean guiding physios to perform? I mean, are you are you holding the head while they do the injection or are you sort of... Um, Might be. Yeah. Um, if you, uh, the, the, sorry. Yeah. If you're there. What? Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, I provide ultrasound scanning services, diagnostic services for physios and podiatrists, etc. And the first question I get asked is, can you inject? And I say, no, because I'm a radiographer. Um, I'm not like a physio who can do the injections. Um, and uh, because like PGDs don't really cover private practice, um, yeah. like they do in the NHS. So um, if I was doing this in NHS, it wouldn't be a problem because it would be just a, a, um, an extension of my um, scope of practice. But as a private yeah. rate sonographer, um, one of the maybe workarounds possibly would be to have the physiotherapist uh, actually with the needle in the hand doing the injecting. And I'm basically got the probe um, over the joint saying yeah. that's where I you should go. Yeah, I think looking at that from a patient centre point of view, that doesn't seem an optimal, optimal experience for the patient. It should be one person doing everything. Yeah. Um, I appreciate your radiographer. I wouldn't speak for your practice, but I know that you're an autonomous professional. So you are accountable for your own actions. Um, the physiotherapist is similarly an autonomous diagnostician and accountable for their actions. So they are responsible for the um, decision to inject and the um, outcome of that injection as well. Um, but that does yeah, raise a bit of an eyebrow when you flip it through the patient centre perspective. Yeah, there's, there's I mean, a few parallels here to um, colleagues in other countries, I think. I think um, certainly Dutch colleagues, I think maybe even the way around, so the, doc the doctor will be perform the injection and maybe some of the physiotherapists will be performing the scan and I think it certainly happens in Sweden as well in some areas of practice as well depending on people's scope I'd imagine these things have probably evolved over time I guess um interesting one I mean yeah from from, um, from my perspective I'd be you know performing a guide injection is a highly technical um task and it's difficult for one person to coordinate the probe and the needle and so I'd imagine for two people to do it if the patient moves and this kind of stuff from a practical, very, very simple practical perspective would be quite challenging, but it's an interesting question. So thank yeah. you, Spencer, for it's, that. It's very frustrating as a, as a, as a radiographer sonographer to not be able to do it. That's the, uh, and we're just looking at where it rounds as, as mm. you know, possibilities. Yeah. yeah I, and, uh, you know, I've been, you know, privileged to, to work for many years with, with colleagues in, in Bemis and, and score. And, and as you say, some of the anomalies like that, Spencer, you know, that they are, frankly ridiculous yeah especially when they don't actually take it as a profession yes you, know, you, you suddenly you've got all these limitations for something that doesn't theoretically exist <laughs> yeah, it is slightly farcical weird so, yeah. yeah you certainly have my, my empathies that's for sure <laughs> the, um, the other sorry go on, I was gonna say, the other thing you could do uh i think right uh you uh yeah you're a diagnostic radiographer you don't have prescribing rights either no. do you no that's the problem where you guys do uh the only other way that you could do that is work under a patient specific direction where the physio prescribes and then delegates administration mm -hmm. to you where you where you then are simply administering the medicine. Right. Is that something that's legally yeah, well, done, it's else, a is that done, it, done elsewhere? Is that something? Well, I, I, was, I was thinking with my medicines hat on there. I mean, right. the, the, the administrate the routes you've got in private clinics you're right you don't have pgds you would then mm. you'd have to either have to be a prescriber or the old traditional prescription administer route right. um so someone's prescribed it by a, yeah. a, a physio and then or, they say, or, or right. a prescriber it could be a doctor yeah. a prescriber has prescribed prescriber. Yeah. the meds but again it doesn't that's where prescribing makes things much more of the one-stop shop mm. um and i'm always cautious where you've got lots of barriers and um, breaks big in in a in a yeah. service because it's what the patient receives 
Yeah, I thought, I mean, I've done the theory um, when I was in the NHS, um, never got quite round to um, injecting because the radiologists wanted all the money. But um, <laughs> it was basically difficult to to get that practice at the time, um, which is one reason why I left the that area. But uh, yeah, just a frustration, really, from my point of view. Just one thing to throw in there, Spencer, we're, we're very fortunate to have um, Alison Hall on um, uh, on the, the call, um, okay. who's, who's responded with a, a a couple of um, suggestions there, and and Alison, uh, you know, is hugely experienced and, and knowledgeable mm. in these areas, and uh, so I'd, I'd encourage you to certainly have a look at the chat where she's put some really good well comments. Uh, plus or minus, reach out to her. So yeah, thanks. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, where do we get to? Uh, I think it was Matt's about yeah. Uh, so can you, yeah. So Matt, can you advise if it's possible to do ultrasound guide injections via a portfolio route? Or are formal courses advised and is becoming a prescriber necessary? Um, sh should we break that into two? Is it is it worthwhile, Pip, you yeah, asking a bit about injection and I'll, I'm happy to sort of tackle the bit about guide injections and education. I think, yes, yeah, Stu, Stu and Mike, you go first, because I think probably the prescribing bit is uh, the the lesser. OK, yeah. So, I mean, guide injections and Mike, yeah, we'll, we'll sort of tackle this together, shall we? Sure. Um, guide injections, um, there is no agreed pathway of training and there are different approaches to it and there are pieces of work going on to try and provide clarity on recommendations uh, around training. Uh, I guess the key thing here would be um, around all these sort of new skill developments is the ability to demonstrate competence um, and therefore formal training that demonstrates competence through whatever it may be um, is important and, and obviously competence can be demonstrated in, in a number of different ways. Um, my little view on this is around, I guess we're sort of nudging into the territories here a little bit of, do I need to scan competently at a certain level to be able to do guided injections? Uh, which is another question that I get far into my inbox on a regular basis. Uh, and I've written a blog on it actually on the website, but it's 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 certainly something that I feel quite passionately that you should have some ultrasound diagnostic skills to be able to uh, then perform guided procedures. That's just me as an individual saying that. That doesn't come from anywhere in particular. Um, Mike, you ch you you carry on around the training stuff. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, again, great questions, Matt. It's it's a very complex area. So um, for me, working with a range of different professions, specialisms, uh, healthcare settings, then um, breaking down what you are and also what you are not doing from an ultrasound perspective in terms of structures you're imaging, differentials you're deriving, how that feeds into the care pathway to, to clinical decision making is, is the real crux of it. So to give a, a couple of polarized um, examples, so uh, the work doing with colleagues from a neurology perspective where um, uh, in the majority of cases it is a clinical decision that spasticity is present and that the use of Botox is indicated, then the imaging is essentially for the safe and accurate delivery of the injectate and avoiding other critical structures. So um, in many ways, by if, you know, if one defines it in that way, um, then you don't need to do anything diagnostic you are observing the structures and observing the delivery of the injectate um another very different perspective uh, perhaps would be uh, and I, I know there'll be different perspectives on this and including within the literature but if from a shoulder perspective um you were uh, determining whether a partial thickness tear uh, um uh, a thickened bursa uh, whatever one might um, decide uh, is maybe a contraindication or, 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 a, or um, a consideration uh, for the delivery of a subacromial injection, then clearly one needs to be skilled as a, um, a differentiator of pathology on ultrasound imaging to inform whether the use of that injection is appropriate or not. So um, for me, working with different professional groups, it's breaking down what you're doing and why and, and how that information is being used. Um, uh, arguably, um, it's also a question of where our uh, aspirations are as, as, a, as a, a clinical group and the ability to combine di differential ultrasound imaging with differential clinical assessment um, presumably is the best of both worlds. 
um, where the two are combined as opposed to treating the scan as it were. So um, it's a great question. From an MSK perspective, there is a strong argument um, that in the majority of cases, the ability to undertake a differential sonographic diagnosis um, as a precursor, adjunct, confirmatory um, precaution, whatever the, the uh, might be appropriate, uh, is necessary within MSK. And I think I would just add that being a prescriber just makes things so much easier in practice. Yeah. So if you have that opportunity, absolutely do it. And I guess the other thing to say is there's no, am I correct in saying that there is no difference if you're doing a landmark guided injection to an ultrasound guided injection, the same um, prescription of the medication and the different frameworks around that are the same? Yeah, that, absolutely. Right? I mean, pres yeah, prescribing is a, yeah, is a completely freestanding yeah. thing. And if you think about putting it in your total toolkit, if you've assessed, you've diagnosed, you've used, you've used POCUS to help you reach that diagnosis, wouldn't it be great if you could then go and treat in that one-stop shop and if you need to um, use some medicines well well great brilliant Matt you just put your hand up yeah, I'm just ask was, question off the back of that last one yeah it was um, so um, uh, you know I, I, I feel under the PGDs uh, I can inject it was more transitioning towards hydrodilatation and uh, you know humeral joint injections where uh, my colleague um, who is a prescriber is able to manipulate the dose to mm. suit uh, his purpose and we were trying to figure out so do I have to go off for two years uh, and a whole lot of work uh, or is there a potential to create a new PGD now I know there's a move away from them but that may be a potential sort of short-term solution particularly um, for that the training isn't two years for a prescriber it'll be six months um, you can do prescribing as you don't have to do it as a whole MSC. There'll be lots and lots of <clears throat> HCPC approved courses that you can, you can do it in a much shorter time. That's brilliant because that wasn't what I was told. I was no. told it was going to take considerably more than six months. OK, mm, I'll look no, around. Uh, if you look, um, the, look at the curriculum framework for all prescribers, it'll be, I'll, I'll pop it in the chat once we go on, it's on the AHPF website, or if you just Google curriculum framework for prescribers, that tells you the entry requirements and what you cover, uh, and then if you search up any, any HEI of your choice, um, they'll do them as freestanding modules, uh, I think they, depending on the level, and you don't have to do it, at level seven prescribing is a level six can you can do it i think at level six as well right so lots of physios will do it at a level seven because they'll put it with an msc yeah okay but that's brilliant it, uh, I, went, I applied to the university of brighton and, and uh, it said it was a lot longer there. i think the connection was getting a bit dodgy mm. thank you mm. Uh, Stu, do you, do you want me to take um, Michael's uh, question that went around formal diagnoses? Oh, Stu's frozen. He's back. Back and back. Back and back. Don't panic. A moment there, I thought the thunderstorm had, had its way with us. <laughs> we've, 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 we've rolled with the punches. We're still going. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, brilliant. So, excellent discussion so far. Really, really interesting. Um, so, Michael, yeah. Hi, mate. Thanks for joining us. Um, so good question. So can we make formal diagnoses with POCUS? This is an interesting one that always goes around. Mike, nice. head. go for it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, as, as Stu said, it's a great question. I, I presume by formal diagnoses, um, you're referring to you, you've seen something structural, uh, which has implications beyond your physio management. So I, I, I'm guessing, I, I, are you on the, I presume you're on the call, Michael? Yeah, he is, yeah. Yeah, okay. I am, uh, yes. Um, as you say, you know, do we have to be careful of how we word things or what we're suggestive of or? Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a great question. I mean, in terms of um, ruling something out, uh, then um, even our very um, skilled sonography colleagues, um, you know, that there are, there are questions around the, the, the best wording um, uh, in terms of whether you rule something out or, you know, no evidence of. Um, 
uh, I guess from an MSK perspective, then you know fractures, um, space occupying lesions, metastatic disease, um, vascular pathology. You know that th there are a few different things that um, perhaps would sit outside of your purely physiotherapy management. Um, uh, that there could be questions around. Um, uh, Stu mentioned before about competency. So uh, you know if one has undertaken specialist training on lumps and bumps, metastatic disease, uh, vascular pathology, um, and that's you know, um, with, with, within one's capabilities, uh, then that's one end of the spectrum. Um, if, if one hasn't undertaken formal training in that, then, then definitely a different end of the spectrum in terms of, you know, um, uh, particularly if, if you're going to exclude anything. Um, Stu, do you want to jump in here before I dig myself a deep hole? Yeah, um, I think, I think that the, the issue here is around and that tradition, this is what's always been discussed, is around the term diagnostic um, ultrasound. And I think this is why the term ultrasound imaging is, if we, if, we, if we keep this focus in a physiotherapy context, I think that's really important that we're talking about ultrasound imaging, how it's used as an assessment tool within that. So, um, yes, you could still argue that ask the question of, OK, so I'm a physiotherapist and I'm doing a scan and I'm doing my clinical assessment. And within that part of it, part of the building blocks is me using ultrasound to explore structural appearance and to either integrate that or to sort of to, to normalize maybe some structural pathology that I see. Um, but I, I, I guess this comes down to, I, I would want physiotherapists to be confident with making diagnosis about what they're seeing on ultrasound. And that then links into training and it links into the requirements around formal training and competency um, around that. And that's why, you know, that's why you know we're we're delighted to be involved with case around uh, sort of standards of imaging um and i think that's what we should be striving for and i think and i think alongside that we should be confidently and accurately reporting our conclusions what we're seeing you know moving away from the ghost scan which is often the term that's used within point of care environments where a scan is performed and it's just sort of done and, and then you know nobody's got any record of it taking place etc cetera, etc cetera. and certainly POCUS is trying to move away from that now let's actually let's let's report in in our clinic let's let's make a conclusion and commit to what we're seeing in a high quality way I think is really important yeah and that then links in really with um the taking of standardized images and their inclusion within the electronic patient record which again is a is a, a, a complex topic but is part of that high quality uh, clinical care really so yeah, so yeah, yeah great question michael brill uh ben what would be the approximate minimum recommended number of sessions cases needed per week slash months maintain competence for newly qualified msk sonographers do you want to take that one Stu? i can I, I can take it i mean i don't think there is a number per se but certainly um ongoing cpd and development and competence is important and certainly if you look at the guidance documents that the CSP has produced, there's a really relevant and accurate section on the importance of CPD, but also linking into this service evaluation and audit as well. Uh, and that's, this, that's all part of this process, isn't it, about demonstration of competence, maintaining competence, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I thought initially your question was around what would I need to do to develop competence? And certainly there have been some figures bounded around within that sphere. Um, certainly in terms of training guidance, and that used to be somewhere around 14 hours a week. Um, but certainly there, I think with that, there has to be some realistic flexibility that people working in different domains will have different exposure. I could be a physio working in an MSK service and have a morning set out where I'm going to try and get my supervised scans, and I might have four uh, lumbar, pain, lumbar spine patients come in, um, whereas I could be working in radiology, and I could do my 14 hours, and I could pretty much get through uh, many sort of tens of you know 50 to 100 you know scans in, in, a, in, a, in a short period of time so um the, the the development to be competent and the number of hours required i think has some flexibility around it and i think once you are qualified or you have done training what's required to maintain cpd and competence um again that there is not a specific figure but what i would encourage is that overall broad appreciation of audit training reflection service evaluation second opinions yeah thank you thanks that uh, that's really helpful i think the context of my question came from me trying to negotiate my job plan 
um, as a newly qualified um, MSK sonographer and, and therefore obviously my employer is, is needing to know you know what is it I need in, in order to, to, to maintain my competency so I, I kind of need a, a I guess a rough rough guideline um, I still know that's not an, not an easy question to answer um, but um, you know one session every month is clearly for me not enough to, to do that um, but it's obviously got to fit with the service as well and not take me too far away from the MSK side of work that I do as well. So um, maybe, maybe it's just room for negotiation, really, I guess. Can I add up something? Sure. Um, when I started doing it, we were saying uh, probably two days a week, if you can, um, it would be good because uh, you, you need that amount of uh, so much experience to see all the different things that you can see um, that, you know, I would say hopefully if you can negotiate a minimum of a couple of days a week, that uh, would be. <laughs> I struggle on that. Asking a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's mean, not going to happen. Uh, no, um, no. Yeah, I, I think the difficulty is when, when when you're newly qualified, you need as much exposure as possible in those early yeah. stages, particularly. Yeah. Um, and, and and that's that's the kind of ammunition I need. But um, you get we've got to balance that with the waiting lists uh, course, for MSK yeah. as well. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a difficult situation. Yeah, I mean, all I would probably say, Ben, uh, from kind of a if we were thinking about it from a, a training perspective, so so you know preceding uh, presumably where you're at at the moment, then um, targeting your training and your exposure to anatomical regions, pathologies, patient groups um, specific to your subsequent scope of practice. So if you're doing one stop shoulder or if you're doing lower limb specific or, or whatever it is you might be doing, uh, then that would ideally allow you to take the the fantastic suggestion the spence had of two days a week which presumably your your manager would would balk at um and and make it much more kind of high value uh, and as to um also mirrored uh, the um uh, the accessibility of those specific types of patients but the really critical thing i would say would be that opportunity for um uh, double scanning lists um for uh, reviewing a complex patient's um, as you said, audits as well. Um, and some of those elements could indeed be done remotely, perhaps depending on, on the access you have access to. So, yeah. Cool. Can you all hear me okay? Yep. I got, out from I, got, I got completely booted out of the call and I, then, I, <laughs> then, I, then I came back in again. So. You're back in the room. I think, I think the, the, the storms in Surrey are uh, causing some, dis, dif, some difficulties. <laughs> um, right, where do we get to the question? I'm just conscious of time as well. Um, uh, let me just have a quick look through. Um, I think Ben also asked about has anybody got a sort of a, um, a, a POCUS job role? Um, not that I'm aware of, and I suspect that'll be something that will now be starting to develop much more off the back of the CSP's guidance, probably, and be and, and, and seem to be integrated more. So I guess watch this space of that one a little bit more. Um, uh, Louise, I'm an advanced podiatrist. Welcome, Louise. Thanks for joining us. Uh, keen to bring up standards of practice, particularly in MSK podiatry. I think what's been shared today would be applicable to the Royal College uh, of Podiatry. Mike, do you want to just, you, you, obviously you're involved with the, the Royal College, aren't you, a fair bit? Uh, sure, yeah, just, yeah, certainly, yeah, with, with a range of colleagues through through um, CASE and other um, organisations. Yeah, so um, my understanding um, is that um, the Royal College of Podiatry um, have... Uh, or are looking to undertake uh, work in this area um, and um, certainly they've got some very, very experienced and um, uh, capable colleagues who I think are, are looking to take this work forward. So um, yeah, that, that opportunity for, for cross fertilization will definitely occur, I think so, yeah. But um, if you can tell them how great it is, then uh, that'd be great. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just gonna look through um Stuart Wehrman yeah great question hi Stuart thanks for joining us um so is a week in ultrasound introduction course followed by being taught and taken through guided injection competency by an experienced physio enough to cover us in the NHS Pips can I oh, I, I was just my you know come in here I've taken back to we get these questions with injection therapy is a weekend yeah. injection therapy course enough to which the answer is no it is not um what our practice guidance is now uh 
recommending it's yeah. it's recommending education at level six um and it would be unlikely that a weekend course would give you that breadth and depth of knowledge that is required bear in mind this is about patient safety um and this is a highly skilled uh, modality um does would a weekend course really offer sufficient expertise but i will hand to mike for far more detailed um support with that yeah i i guess the 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 not the cheeriest but perhaps a, a kind of litmus test would be you know if, if you're standing in front of a, a court of law and, and you have to justify one's practice then you know one end of the spectrum you know um somebody showed me and i had a go uh, versus uh, I've undertaken formal training in this area and, and um, here are the, um, uh, the, the to examine um, on unseen patient review of my competency um, with these different quality assurance mechanisms in place, uh, then that would give you, um, perhaps, you know, likely very different levels of, uh, of confidence in defending your practice. So um, I guess the litmus test I, I would say would be around being able to defend your practice another perspective one of the reasons why i shared earlier on about the the kind of you know that the kind of context of ultrasound imaging is that you know our sonography and radiology colleagues that you know literally spend years and years training um uh, to do this it's it's a very very complex skill so um uh, that perhaps provides some some further context so. yeah and i yeah, guess, I I guess just, sorry go on, sorry, sorry yeah you mind if i just expand on that a little bit so um the documents you created are amazing, by the way. Like we literally just, I work in Taunton and we just created an SOP around the governance for the, uh, the use of ultrasound in physio. I'm a physio myself. Um, and we were able to sort of hyperlink all this into it as well. But what, what we uh, sort of agreed without, you know, ha having seen the documents first is that if you've done a course in ultrasound, even if it's an introduction, then you can be taught by somebody to, in to do guided injections if you're already an injector. Are you saying there might actually should be a case accredited course and as, as a bare minimum before you can do guided injections? Sure, yeah, it's it's a really tricky one um, because um, a much very high quality um, education in various guises um, may not be case accredited for a variety of reasons, including the fact that case only accredits certain types of courses and historically only from certain types of organizations. Um, so uh, the, 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 and, and indeed, if, if you have a look at the publications we have out in pelvic floor and lung, then um, uh, currently there are not um, physiotherapy bespoke specific um, case accredited courses in those areas. So, so we outlined some kind of recommendations within those. So definitely have a look at the, the pelvic paper, for example. Um, uh, again, it's come back to those those foundation principles around being able to defend one's practice, um, covering all of the requisite areas that enable an individual to undertake safe and competent practice. Um, and indeed, many of the mechanisms that Stu mentioned post-qualification um, uh, in discussion with Ben around uh, that maintenance of competency, that, that progression of competency as well. Um, so I, I know it's a complete politician's answer, Stu. I do apologize, but... No, it is a little bit. So, but, so, so what about things like, you know, uh, the, the chap I'm working with wants to do the smug introduction. It's like a two day course. And obviously there's the ultrasound site as well. You guys do those introductory courses. So somebody really needs to go beyond that then. So I, I was kind of I was kind of saying, well, as long as you've got uh, the basics of the novology, the physics, uh, you know, to hold the probe and, you know, I can then teach you the injection that you're probably doing blind anyway, then that should be fine. But we're saying it needs to go further, basically. Yeah, I think I'll, hand up here. yeah, I'll come yeah, in here. Yeah. I've just I've been having a quick look Sorry. through our context <laughs> document just to double check. What the CSP is saying now is that members should seek to undertake mm -hmm. training at level six in England and Wales. That's level 10 in Scotland. Uh, but as Mike very validly said, where such programs exist. So um, it's uh, and obviously the CSP, we are not a regulatory body, we can't enforce things, but what we do is we gently encourage practice by having this document out, it becomes part of the body of reasonable practice, and we are wanting to move members along away from 
you know, a C1, do one, off you go. Um, and hopefully this will be the same as injection therapy, whereas weekend courses have just completely fizzled out because they're not, um, not acceptable and the university programmes have flourished. Um, and I would hope to see a similar move. So aspire but where there isn't a programme and Mike's highlighted those areas, you just need to make sure that you can demonstrate what you're doing is reasonable and ultimately safe. This is about patients, not necessarily us. Yeah, I mean, if I just offer a few more thoughts from somebody who's kind of, I guess, lived the landscape of these sorts of, mm. of, of, of training and education around ultrasound for several years now. Um, I guess one, one thing here is that unfortunately, we're not talking about a modality that has come onto the scene where there's a really established educational framework to support it mm -hmm. and, to, and to, to build it. We're talking about an educational framework that's responding to a growth of something that has become quite innovative and is rapidly evolving. And so actually, and Mike, correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but historically the educational offering to ultrasound has lagged miles behind the actual use of it in clinical practice. Okay, so first of all, we've got we've got quite a large headache essentially um, with that with that situation, um, and as a result, it's difficult for the guidance document to say anything absolute because, mm. as Mike's alluded to, there's so many different subdomains of ultrasound use within physiotherapy, where and some of them have established educational offerings, and some of them are very much in their infancy. Um, within MSK, you've obviously got your, if you like, your traditional diagnostic, for want of a better phrase, MSK ultrasound programs. Yeah. So within that, you've got introductory courses at weekends. You've got case courses that have, have, have certainly developed uh, and become much more on the radar from an MSK perspective over the past, say, five years, I would say. Uh, and, and, and as part of that, the CSP has become a member organization of case to support that use as well. And that gives demonstrable formal competency, usually through an HEI. Um, the guide injections is a bit different, I think, because, again, it's a rapidly developing landscape. And this is partly why, and I, and I don't mind shameless to plug in the Brunel program that we put together, the guide injection program, was to try and offer competency around this new skill development. Um, so I, I think it's a landscape that's rapidly evolving. I think people will choose different routes through it. I think the CSP guidance document is incredibly important to be aware of and to look at and to pay reference to and, and to, to take your learning around that. Um, the introductory weekend courses also serve a really useful role, I think, to give people an idea about well, because it is, a, as, as you know, Stuart, it is a massive thing to take on from a professional perspective. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a completely different skill set to develop. And uh, so some people choose to do these weekend courses to, to explore, to dip their toe in it and to see where they go with it. And some do it. A significant portion who come on our courses now actually then go on to do the PG cert. They come on the weekend course, uh, they explore it. They think about how it can be used in their practice. What do I need to do? What do I need to line up? What's the reality of the situation? And they go on to do the formal sort of university program because that's tends to be what people tend to sort of feel like they want to do. But this is a, this is a, an evolving landscape. Yeah. The, 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 the people's desires and wishes, and the guidance documents around it are all rapidly developing. Um, you know, the physio document came out in what, April, I think, Pip, was that right to say? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, that's taken many, many years to come into fruition. So um, it's a rapidly, rapidly changing sort of landscape. But hopefully that gives you some thoughts on it, Stuart. I wish we could just give you a line. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Um, where do we get to? Um, I'm just going to sort. Of, I'm just conscious of time, guys. So I'm just going to whiz through. Um, let's just go to the bottom. Um, uh, is a PG cert not level seven? Siobhan said. I think they are, but I think what we yeah. wanted to say from the CSP is there isn't an expectation that it's a level seven because that's what we didn't want to do is disadvantage physiotherapists where other professions. Uh, might have different th um, different expectations. So, yeah, by all means, yeah. do a PG cert, but a level six is what we're, which is graduate level. Yeah, and I think that uh, refers back to what I was saying before: is that there's the difference. The, the guidance document is to try and support hmm. the development of all different sub disciplines of ultrasound use within physiotherapy, and 
it, it wouldn't be right to write the guidance document with just paying reference to one of those subspecialities such as MSK. Um, you know, lung ultrasound is a, is a huge growth area within physiotherapy at the moment, and the guidance document was designed to try and support that as well. And it may be that that's a different, you know, the offering there is at a slightly different level to the PG cert level that's where that's developed, I guess. Um, bro, um, okay. Um, where do we stand, Stuart? Another good question from you. Where do we stand on high volume, high dilatation, barbitage, nerve hydrosection? Pips coming to you, I think. Needle fenestration. <laughs> I've learned many interventions, but never been formally signed off. Well, I think the first thing to say with that is probably to pay reference to the changes in scope of practice around injection therapy. Pip, would that be? Uh, I think the answer depends uh, on what they are. Yeah. What What do you mean by where do we stand? um is it you know is it within scope of physiotherapy practice i mean i think, I think, that's, what, I think that's what i'm asking is it within our scope I, I think your document says it's so broad that it is if you're trained in it and again if you i've, I've been trained by working with an sem consultant for example but i was never never from for me signed off or had a course or anything like that to prove that um from a medical legal point of view you know, am I standing there imagining I'm in court defending myself or, or I'm not quite sure exactly, you know, where we stand as a profession on, on these interventions, I guess. They are, they are, well, I'm, I don't do these. So that's why I, was, I think Mike Stewart, they are, from my understanding, these are well recognised interventions that would be done by physiotherapists. So they're within the scope of the profession. I would have a concern if you as an individual were doing something where you didn't yourself believe you were educated, trained and competent, um, because we should all be working within the scope of our own competence, regardless of whether something is within the scope of the profession. Uh, you know, I'm an MSK physio. I would never put um, botulinum into a spastic muscle. It's not my scope. <laughs> You're on mute, Stu. <laughs> hey, we have to get it in. <laughs> this thunderstorm's doing my head in. Anyway, um, so, um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're complex procedures, as Pip said. You know, it all comes back to your own individual scope, practice and competency. Um, I think the other thing is just play reference to is the changes around things such as nerve blocks. Um, from a CSP perspective recently, Pip, I think, isn't there, in terms of injection therapy, just looking at things like yeah. the, uh, nerve hydro di dissection and that kind of stuff. Needle fenestration, that tends to refer more to things like ganglions and cysts and that kind of stuff. And I think that probably then all comes into a local discussion about within that trust, what is the actual scope around that service? What's the demonstration? What is the training requirement? What's the demonstration of competency? And does that trust recognize that as being within your job role, probably from a trust perspective? Um, yeah, that'd be my thoughts on it probably. Um, and I guess, you know, things like high dilatation, barbitage, these, these are techniques that are high level uh, ultrasound clinical, but also guided procedures. You know, they're, they're quite technical tasks, you know, you're talking about high volumes going into joints. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's good to have a, 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 a way of demonstrating your competency in training around these procedures um certainly and i guess you know you're talking about nerve hydro hyd you know hydro dissection i just draw reference back to what we talked about earlier um certainly you need to have good diagnostic and probe skills and handling skills to be able to to, to accurately and needle skills to accurately do those kind of things um but also you know nerve blocks and that kind of stuff are are, are you know uh, interesting to look at from an injection therapy scope practice as well and I think just to clarify, um, if you're working in the NHS, you're covered by your employer's liability. What Stu alluded to is, yes, we have excluded a number of, um, we've ex excluded spinal injection and nerve blocks from the scope of indemnity cover. So it doesn't mean that it's not within the scope of practice. It just means the CSP scheme uh, will not ensure you to do them any more. Um, taken on a risk management basis you know as Stu said these are highly highly um, 
skilled interventions where the potential for a damage is huge um, and therefore the risks in private practice, you know, non-hospital setting are that much higher. So you will need to have separate insurance to do that and pay the premium that will be commensurate with the risk. Cool. I think we're, I'm just conscious of time. I think we're probably going to try and wrap it up um, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, I think a few people are trying to uh, sort of making a move as well. Um, for me, just to finish off with, thank you so much to uh, Pip and Mike for your time, expertise and energy and, and all, you, all that you do. Um, it's been a really, really good session, really, really interesting. I mean, I, I, as everyone knows, I love these discussions. I think they're absolutely fascinating. It's such an interesting era, ultrasound. Sometimes it's frustrating because you can't provide absolute clarity with the answers. But it's, as I keep saying, it's a rapidly evolving landscape. And uh, for that reason, it's a fascinating area of clinical practice. Um, and the CSP have done a great job at putting together the first iteration of giving us a little bit of something now to give us scope to, and, and, and not scope, but guidance to, to develop our skills in this area and hopefully uh, progress and take the profession forward. So um, thanks so much to, uh, to Pip and to Mike. Do you guys want to say anything to sort of wrap up? Well, I've it's been hugely enjoyable. So thank you very much. I've learned a lot as well. And I think, you know, this is there. It's the first inter, inter, iteration. Embrace it and really use it to really showcase what physiotherapists can offer in managing um, care pathways and complex patients. So, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a good call. Yeah. And um, certainly for colleagues from uh, other specialisms, but also from other healthcare settings uh, internationally, then um, do feel free to reach out. Uh, my email's on uh, the talk from today. Um, and also um, you can just Google Mike Smith Cardiff University, I'll pop up. Um, do feel free to reach out. Um, uh, I've got experience with supporting a range of different uh, groups and uh, be very happy to support you. Yeah, I'll put my email on the chat. So if anyone wants to get in touch, I can obviously forward on to Pip and Mike as required as well. Um, I have recorded this session. Um, I'll chat to Pip and Mike about how we use that going forwards, but it may be that we're able to use it going forwards. Uh, I think it's in about four different chunks due to the thunderstorm. So it might take me a little while to try and uh, stitch it back to <laughs> stitch it back together. Um, but I will um I'll see how we get on with that. And I will obviously update on social media and everything else uh in due course. But um yeah, Pip's just put her um email on the um uh on the chat as well. And Johnny, yeah, we'll get in touch. We'll chat. Brilliant. And again, Stu, thanks very much for um for setting up. Much appreciated. I'm just relieved that we managed to uh effectively manage most of the technical aspects of it. <laughs> and I think Enjoy. your thunderstorm's heading my way now. It's suddenly got very dark outside. <laughs> yeah, no, I think <laughs> hopefully I think we're all desperate for it to happen, I think, aren't we at this point? So um super. Thanks very much, guys. We'll wrap it thanks, up. Guys. Cheers. Bye.